My, I usually have these awesome earbuds. They are like um, Bose, like fantastic. Um, but I just did another live on Facebook and a couple of minutes in it just went call ended. And then I looked and I had killed the battery on my um, headphones. So I'm just going to do a quick live today. I'm not going to stay on super long. Um, I'm just going to show you a quick stretch and fold, do a quick little discussion about the essential processes of sourdough um, and show you the next little tutorial that I've been working on over the last couple of days. Um, so as we go, if you have any questions, put them into the live chat. I, uh, it helps me, it encourages me, um, makes me feel better when I can see that you guys are there and participating. And I really like answering those questions. So definitely ask as we go. Um, so I'm just going to turn my camera here and show you what we're working on. So check out this little guy. So we took the beginner bread recipe, so just our regular um, beginner bread recipe, increase the hydration slightly. So on the YouTube channel, please subscribe, you know what I mean? Please comment on everything, please help me grow the following. But on my YouTube channel, right at the top of the main page, there's the beginner bread recipe. Um, this is the basic essential recipe that we recommend beginners start with. It's easy, it's easy to follow, it's easy to manage, it gives you a high chance of success when you're just starting it with sourdough. Um, the level two hydration is where you sort of mastered the beginner bread recipe. You're starting to feel really comfortable with sourdough. And so now you increase your starter and your water slightly um, to start taking that slightly denser, low hydration loaf that you've been practicing with and getting towards a lighter um, inside crumb and a crispier crust. So I mixed up the level two hydration beginner bread recipe and I um, practiced a bunch of processes, but here's what I ended up deciding to go with. I did the essential processes in order. So I fed my starter before bed. I got up in the morning. I mixed my dough to a shaggy dough. I stretched and folded with 30 minutes rest in between. Janine Roberts says, wow, I love baking. Thanks for being here, Janine. I love seeing you here. Um, I finished my stretch and fold, so four sets of stretch and fold. So that's a bit, now we've been in about two hours. I let my dough bulk proof in my clear straight-sided containers. So make sure on the channel, you go to the baking um, bread playlist and watch the bulk proofing success video. After the beginner bread recipe, it's the number one game changer for making sure that your dough, your bread is coming out beautifully um, because it's almost always, if your sourdough is messed up, it something happened in the, um, in the bulk proofing phase. So this method that we use helps to improve that. And I'll talk about that in a second. Sandy says, love the level two. Oh good, I'm so glad. It's I always use the level two. So what's the difference? So the beginner bread recipe, both recipes use a thousand grams of flour and 20 grams of salt and make two loaves. You can split it right down the middle if you just want a single loaf. The beginner bread recipe uses 120 grams of starter and 680 grams of water. The level two hydration uses 200 grams of starter and 700 grams of water. So it's not a huge water difference. It's only 20 grams, but 20 grams can make a big difference. Um, but it's an increase in the starter and starter certainly contributes to hydration, right? You've got a third starter, a third flour and a third water, right? So there's water in there. The water and flour kind of cancel themselves out, but that third of starter that you've gotten in, got in there had already started to ferment. And what happens to flour and water when it ferments? It eventually turns to liquid. So depending Depending on how far into the fermentation process your starter is, the more it's going to contribute to the hydration in your bread. So it's harder to quantify, but we find that adding 200 grams of starter and the level two hydration with just that slight water increase increases the, the nice good spring of your loaf and the crispy outside loaf and the good crumb on the inside, but keeps it from being too sticky. So I took my level two hydration. I finished bulk proofing it in the containers. I dumped it out of the container. I pre-shaped it into one dough. So I got it, got rid of that stickiness, built some nice tension, got it into a nice perfect circle, took my knife and cut it into four equal sizes. And then I pre-shaped each one of these four little guys. So now I've got four equal size doughs. They worked out to about 250 grams each. 
Uh, then I let them rest. I flipped them over and shaped them just like I always did. So stretch out that dough a little bit, laminate, or sorry, make a pamphlet, right? Fold the top third down and the bottom third up, turn it sideways, roll it, make it into a nice ball. I took these little ramekins. Everybody's got something like this around the house. I lined them with parchment paper, like shoved as much parchment paper in there as I could, as tightly as I could. I took my little dough balls that were now shaped, really well floured, the parchment paper was really well floured, flipped them into these ramekins with seam side up, sort of sewed up those seams to build good tension, and then stuck these in the fridge and cold proofed them overnight. Uh, and then in the morning, I took them out, dumped them onto little mini squares of parchment, and bake them in these. And who doesn't have these around? And if you don't, then your mom does, or your neighbor does, or you can find them at the secondhand store. These things are so common. And sourdough for beginners, right? I'm always trying to make things easy for people, right? I, and the easiest thing is to be able to use what you've already got in the fridge. Um, so I banked these little guys in here. Now, I'll show you something. This is not fitting. When I actually took them out of the oven, they had expanded on the bottom and I actually had to take a, a butter knife and sort of pry them out. So it wasn't quite the right size. So I am going to do this again today with one of the doughs that I have mixed up. I'll show you how to stretch and fold these in just a second and talk about the processes. But this time I'm going to cut it into six instead of four. And I think I'm going to use uh, my muffin tins with muffin liners to cold proof these in. Um, I've seen lots of people doing that. Um, but I think once all of this is all said and done, I've taken tons of pictures and tons of video and sort of walked through, I might combine this all into one tutorial, use this recipe, you know what I mean? Follow this process at this exact point in the process, do this with the dough and make yourself either four or six of these um, amazing buns. So they're squishy, they're soft. Look at the beautiful crumb. They smell amazing. My daughter actually dug hers out and put her sandwich stuff inside of it. Um, my husband's sandwich was about that big when he was done. We had to like squish them down to make them fit. So I'm just gonna go a little bit smaller. So I thought you guys might like that. I haven't posted about these anywhere on social media yet. So if you're watching this and seeing this live, you're the second people to see it. I just showed them on Facebook a few minutes ago, but same thing during the live. So no posts. Um, but if you're here and you're not already subscribed to the channel, I would love it so much if you would. Um, it helps me. And then of course you'll see these tutorials as they come out. So this is the level two hydration beginner bread recipe. I mixed it up this morning. It's had one stretch and fold done. Excuse me. <coughs> I have got a little bit of a cold. I have started, um, I used to mix my two doughs in a big bowl and leave the doughs in that big bowl until the stretch and fold process was over. So I would do my four sets of stretching and folding in this big steel bowl. But a member in our group who makes beautiful bread, so we have a huge group on Facebook. It's got uh, 750,000 members or something we started it. And one of our members makes beautiful bread. And he made a post about how he's always trying to really retain the moisture in his dough from the time he mixes it. Excuse me, I've got a tickle. <coughs> Excuse me. So I've been trying his method all week and it's actually been working great. What I did was I mixed up my bread, I split my bread as soon as it was done being mixed into my two ball proofing containers. If you're new to sourdough and you just happen to find me and you're just watching, you don't know what the heck I'm talking about, go to the channel, find the beginner bread recipe, find the bread, um, baking playlist, find the essential processes video. All of these things are broken down for you. Quick, easy, good to go. But if you do know what I'm talking about, we let our dough bulk proof in these clear straight sided containers because as they're bulk proofing, it helps us to really see how much the bread has risen and control our, our dough so that it doesn't under or over proof. And almost all cases of a, dough, a loaf that isn't great is either over or under proof. So this is like a game changer thing. 
Um, B1 Grob says, I'm an awesome cook, but can't bake for the life of me. Been trying to get a simple pound cake down and it just doesn't ever work out. You know, I used to always be like that too. Um, I think what it is, is cooks are kind of used to just throwing in a little bit of this and throwing in a little bit of that. What helped me get good at baking was first, like following the recipe verbatim, understanding what the process was and like over time starting to understand how food works together. And then I just started adjusting on my own. So I went from someone who rarely baked and always cooked to someone who I don't want to cook because all I want to do is bake. Um, the cool thing about sourdough is if you can get yourself a good starter going and start playing around with it, it's kind of fun. It's really challenging, which sort of keeps you going because you want to overcome it. But it's also kind of a lot more willy-nilly too. So um, Rich says, what flour do you use for your sourdough? Sorry, I meant which flour for your starter. That's okay. Um, I use all-purpose, regular all-purpose flour. You can pretty much use any flour you want. Um, I know that there are, there's a lot of rhetoric out there about how you have to use glass and you shouldn't use metal and your your lid should be loose or have a breathable lid um, and that you can't use bleached all purpose and you shouldn't use tap water, right? And the reality is that some of those things are best practices, right? If you're in a place where there's heavy chlorine content in your water and you wouldn't drink it, then it would make sense not to put it in your bread. But if you're like me and you've got spring fed, fed well water, of course you can use it, right? So everything is kind of fluid, um, but as a person who focuses on teaching beginners and making the process easy for people who are totally new to sourdough and just first encountering it, I like to use the simplest materials and the simplest ingredients possible um, to make it accessible to everybody. So later you can start to graduate. But another great thing about All Purpose is that it's the cheapest flour. So if you mess up half a dozen loaves, you don't feel so bad about throwing it away versus had people message me in a panic being like, there's $40 worth of rye flour in here and trying to help them. So, all right. So this bread was mixed in the big bowl. I split it right after the mix into my bulk proofing containers. I've completed one set of stretch and folds. This is going to be my second set of stretch and folds. So all I'm going to do is just lightly get my hand just damp, right? Like to do the whole thing, not wet, not soaked, but damp. And I'm going to reach underneath my dough I'm gonna pull it straight up. I'm gonna fold it on top of itself. I'm gonna turn, I'm gonna go on this side. I'm gonna pull it straight up. I'm gonna fold it on top of itself. What stretching and folding is doing is building strength in the dough. So you'll notice that if I go stretch and fold again, the dough is stretching much less. On that first stretch and fold that I did, and I'll show you again on this one, the dough came way up, right? But as you stretch and fold, it starts to resist you. It's building strength, it's creating elasticity. So at each stretch and fold, you can feel the strength building, right? But when you do multiple stretch and folds, you continue to build strength. Now, as you become more experienced, there's ways to know that you for sure have built enough strength. But what we instruct beginners is to just do four sets. That's enough then you can feel confident, learn the basic essentials to get started, get a few good loaves under your belt, then start learning about all the advanced stuff, right? Learn about coil folds and the window pane effect and everything else. But none of those things are gonna help you if you can't get to a decent loaf. So that's all we focus on here is how can we simplify it as much as possible? How can we use tools that are around the house? How can we use inexpensive ingredients? How can we make it so everyone can do it? So, um, and Rich just asked what kind of flour, what kind of, uh, do I use in my starter? All purpose. Um, I often add spelt to my bread recipes. I love the taste of it. I occasionally can find rye at the grocery store and I'll do an all rye bread, right? But it's a much more complicated process using whole wheats or einkorns or rye flours absorb a lot more water. So you need to have a much higher hydration. They also proof much faster. Um, so they're a little bit more advanced to work with. So what we say is if you can, as long as there's nothing preventing you from using a basic flour, try to start with these basic ingredients. However, on the channel, in the baking playlist, we do have a 100% whole wheat beginner bread recipe. And that tutorial 
covers how it differs and why it's a little bit more advanced and why it's a little bit harder to work with, but still gets you through it. So I'm gonna stretch and fold this. And if you watch on this first stretch and fold, the dough will come way up and stay stuck to the bottom, right? But as I work my way around, it comes up a little less each way, right? So what we're doing is building strength, right? And what we want is strength in our bread so that when it's bulk proofing, it's staying together. And when it's pre-shaping, we're able to build some good tension into it. And when it's baking in the oven, it's holding on to that tension that we built when we pre-shaped and shaped our bread and allowing the bread to really spring. So stretching and folding is one of the essential processes. So we, um, we created a set of essential processes. This is what they are. Feed your starter before bed, mix your dough in the morning, 30 minutes rest, stretch and fold four times, right? So that's about two hours and five minutes. It takes about five minutes to mix, right? Then get your dough, or either right after mixing or after stretching and folding, get your dough into clear straight-sided containers. The recipe makes two loaves of bread, right? You can absolutely split it in half if you want to, directly down the middle, right? Um, then we are going to bulk proof our dough in clear straight sided containers. So once we get our dough into this container, we're going to kind of squish it down into the container. We're going to take a marker and we're going to mark the height of where our dough was, right? And see like it's high here and it's low here and it's not touching here at all, right? We're going to try and push it down as much as we can, but sourdough spreads rather than rises. So if you make a yeast spread, right, and it, it, you put it in a bowl in a ball, it expands like a ball. Sourdough doesn't do that. Sourdough spreads, it's growing. But we see people say all the time, oh, well, I've been waiting for 12 hours and it hasn't risen. It has, it's just that it's in a big giant steel or, or plastic or whatever, wooden bowl that's huge and has angled sides. So as it's spreading and growing and overproofing eventually it you can't see it so with these containers not only does it make it much easier for a beginner to see how much their dough has proofed and really determine is it at that 75 percent or 100 percent or whatever it is i'm trying to go for but it also helps them troubleshoot so maybe they go to what they estimate as double and find that their loaf came out a little dense and maybe they think that it was a little bit underproofed. Well, now they can remember what they did last time. They can even leave markings on the container from last time and go a little further and vice versa. If they think that if their dough comes out overproofed and is too sticky and hard to manage, then they can start going back and saying, okay, well then I'm gonna shorten my bulk proofing time. I'm gonna use these containers to see with my eyes that it's less. It's still an estimation with these containers, right? We can never get the dough to be perfectly flat at first as it sort of spreads out once it hits a barrier. And that's why we say these containers clear and straight sided, right? And about eight cups for a single loaf. What they do is give you a way to estimate. So if you use your marker to mark what your height was, if over here, it was very low, but over here it was up here, but now the whole dough is like this all the way around. Well, here it's only grown like a third, but here it's like quadrupled. So you're still gonna be estimating, right? It's still an estimate, but it kind of helps. Rich says, after you recommended four sets of stretch and folds, how long for bulk rise? So the, generally, um, bulk, uh, bulk proofing takes four to eight hours, right? So we've got bulk fermenting. Bulk fermenting starts as soon as we add starter to anything, right? So that started when we started mixing. We've spent two hours stretching and folding now, um, plus five or 10 minutes to mix, however long it takes. Usually bulk proofing takes between four and eight hours. In some extreme cases, for example, if you're at really high altitude, it can take less than that. If you're in a really, really hot and humid climate, it might only take two and a half or three hours to bulk proof. On the other end of the spectrum, rarely, but if you're in a very cold environment or something's happening in your mix, it could take 10 hours. That's why we say never go by time, always go by what your dough is doing. Use the this method, watch your dough, keep an eye on it, and, and stop it from bulk proofing when it gets to where you're trying to go. 
there's all kinds of advanced techniques out there and I absolutely encourage you to get to those once you're comfortable with what needs to happen. Um, so some people use temperature and say, okay, well, my dough was at 72 degrees. So that means if I, uh, that I need to go to 50% or whatever it is, right? You can get into that if you want, but even if you're doing that, still keep it in these containers so that you can see what's happening with your dough. My dough takes about five hours altogether um, from the end of the time that from when stretching and folding ended. Um, thanks, Rich. I love the questions. Um, so after bulk proofing, the next thing that we hear from beginners all the time is my dough is really sticky. Um, I cannot manage it. So there's two things. If it's really sticky and no matter what you do, it won't hold its shape, then it's overproofed um, and you should probably just bake it right away. Um, I just want to rewind for a second. If you are going to bake your dough on the same day, so we recommend beginners for their first two or three loaves, do their first loaf on a day when they're home all day. Feed your starter before bed. There's a little timing video in the playlist. Um, do, do your starter before bed, get up early in the morning, mix, stretch and fold, get it into the bulk proofing containers, watch it through the day, right? Then pre-shape it, shape it, score it, bake it all in the same day. Cold proofing is an optional process. It's an excellent process. It's a great process, but if you're not getting bulk proofing right, cold proofing is just going to magnify the situation. If you underproofed, cold proofing might fix it, but it'll give, then it'll keep you underproofing, right? Might fix it a little. If you overproofed, cold proofing is just going to make it worse. So what we say is skip it at first. Now, once you start incorporating cold proofing, we say if you're going to bake the same day, let your dough go to 100%. If you're going to cold proof, let your dough go to 75%. As you become more experienced, as you begin to understand the dough, you can start being more precise, right? You can start incorporating in following temperatures or experimenting with going on a, a, a big overproof and how that affects the dough, right? But just at first, when you're trying to get used to those scenarios, do that. So four to five hours from my last stretch and fold, now my dough is... is um, at about 75% because I'm going to cold proof and make um, these little buns that I just showed you again, except I'm gonna do six instead of four this time. I'm gonna take this dough out. I'm gonna pre-shape it. So two kinds of sticky. Sticky and won't hold its shape, overproofed. Sticky, when it first comes out of the bulk proofing container, totally normal. The reason that we stretch and fold sourdough is because it is sticky. It's supposed to be sticky. That's the way it is. Pre-shaping helps manage that. Can I bake the dough right out of the fridge then, or should I wait for it to get to room 10? Right out of the fridge. I like doing it right out of the fridge. I think it holds its shape a little bit better, but straight out of the fridge or bringing it to room temp, I've tried both ways. They both work fine, so it's all personal preference. For me, like I keep my... Um, I keep my starter in the fridge already fed. So I feed my starter right after I mix. I let it double on the counter, then I stick it in the fridge. And two days later, I pull it straight out of the fridge and bake with it. So, and I mean, this so this was fed two days ago. I let it double on the counter and now it's in the fridge sitting like this sort of on pause because the fridge is keeping it from fermenting really fast, ready for me to bake, right? So um, I think either way is fine, whatever you prefer. Pre-shaping, we use a bench scraper or me, if you've seen the video, people make fun of me all the time. I use like a straight sided knife. I dump this super sticky dough out onto the counter. No flour, no water. I touch it as little as possible with my hand at first. I use the bench scraper sort of just slightly underneath the dough and start pulling it in a circle so that it starts gathering. And when we pre-shape like that, as we keep going around, and I've got a pre-shaping video in my shorts and um, in the baking tutorials, and you'll see what happens is at the beginning when you touch that dough, you put your fingers on it and you pull it up, it's so sticky. And if you tried to shape that into a loaf, it wouldn't work very well, especially if you're inexperienced and don't necessarily know how to handle that dough, right? So you're gonna say it's too sticky, it's ruined, right? But that's not the case if it's not overproofed. If it's perfect otherwise, 
what you do is you do this pre-shaping. Pre-shaping builds tension into the dough, so it starts bringing the dough into itself. Right now, it's all spread out. It's been, it's been bulk proofing for four hours. It's been spreading, right? It's been building all of these bubbles and blending your, your gluten structures together, right? Now, it's, so it's gotten used to being spread out, right? Now, we do our pre-shaping and we're gathering it together. We're trapping that air inside. And by the time you're done pre-shaping, you should have sort of a, a fairly perfect half ball sitting on your counter and you should be able to rub it and there's like a skin on the outside. We let our dough rest after pre-shaping for 20, 30 minutes or so. Um, and then we um, do our final shaping. Teresa says, what flour do you use? I use a lot of regular all-purpose flour. Um, and then I often add things like spelt or rye or anything else. Um, Rich, that's so helpful. See you later. Thanks for being here, Rich. I love it. Um, so after the pre-shaping, then we take our sort of nicely shaped dough that's got this skin on top. We stick our hands underneath. We stretch it a little bit flip it over onto the counter. And now this is when we're gonna use flour, right? We've got flour on the counter. We make a pamphlet with our dough, fold the top third down, the bottom third up, roll it into our loaf, shape it into our loaf shape. And then at that point, we are either gonna score it and bake it or drop it into a banneton and cold proof it and continue on from there. So those are the essential processes. Everything else is either optional or advanced. So that's what we're teaching. Anyhow, I just wanted to pop on quick and show you guys the stretch and fold and show you guys my little bun that I'm super excited about. That's gonna be my next tutorial. Um, if you're not subscribed already, please do. And if you stayed and watched this whole thing with me, thank you so much. I'll talk to you all again soon.